Welcome back to another episode of Chemistry Review. Woohoo! This is topic 4.02, radioactivity. Now, today we're just going to be dealing with the history and detection of radioactivity. And then the next video, we're going to take a look at how to complete radioactive decay equations. I know I can't wait either, but we're going to have to because we've got this to do. So we're going to start our journey off in 1896 with one Henri Becquerel, who actually discovered that radioactive materials expose photographic film. Now, he didn't know they were radioactive before this. Basically, you put a rock containing a radioactive material on a packet of protected photographic film. See, here's the film and here's the protective package. You put the rock on top of it. Then you expose the, and then you develop the film and you'll see that, well, the film took a picture of the rock right through the protective paper which means that there must be some sort of rays that are coming off the rock and going through the paper and into the film. And this, these rays, well, that's radiation, radioactivity. So this was the first discovery that there was something really funky going on. So let's continue. Pierre and Marie Curie in 1898 discovered a couple of interesting elements, radium and polonium, which were significantly more radioactive than uranium. In fact, they gave off so much energy that if you were to mix these elements in with glow-in-the-dark paint, they would cause the glow-in-the-dark paint to glow. Now, you know how you have those like stars you can put on your ceiling and then they glow when you turn off the light, but they gradually fade right as the night goes along. This is called phosphorescent. So what happens is when you give like fluorescent materials uh, light, fluorescence means that you give them light in one frequency or wavelength of light, and then they re-emit it as a different frequency or wavelength of light. When you turn off the light, the fluorescence will stop. But in phosphorescent substances, they actually don't stop glowing. They give off their glow slowly. They lose their glow until eventually it's gone. Well, if you mix those paints in with a radioactive mineral containing radium or polonium, the radioactivity they give off will cause these materials to keep glowing not just until the night is over, but for years. And as you can see here, with any new discovery, people suddenly pounce on it as being some sort of incredible medical cure. You see right here, 42 tablets of genuine arium, right? That's the trade name for uh, radium tablets. Price $1, and that was a lot of money back then. Take two tablets with a glass of water before or after each meal to derive the most beneficial effects, which, you know, we don't even know what they are. Uh, arium should be taken regularly and as directed. Read in closed circular. Now, this actually doesn't do anything except significantly increases the chances that you're going to get some sort of intestinal tract cancer. But, you know, because it was new, an incredible new discovery, and wow, it has all this energy in it. Maybe it gives you energy. <laughs> no, it gives you death. So you always want to make sure before taking any kind of medication that you double check the claims and make sure that it has been approved for use. If you see the label says this has not been approved for to treat any particular disorder, you might want to skip it. People are basically just trying to sell you stuff and whether or not you die is kind of up to you. Well, <laughs> they don't sell Arium anymore. Here's another practical use of this glow-in-the-dark material, radioactive clocks. Yes, your child can get a wristwatch that has radium paint on Donald Duck's hands, and as the time goes on, your kid can see the time in the dark. Of course, this is past their bedtime and they might get radiation poisoning or they might even get cancer, but hey, it's an interesting novelty. By the way, they don't use radioactive hands anymore for these wristwatches or clocks. In fact, in order to paint such incredible detail on these clock faces, it required workers to actually paint, hand paint, this radioactive paint onto the clocks. And how do you keep your brush tip sharp? Well, you use your tongue because you're pressed for time. 
And these poor women found themselves with horrible tumors on their tongues and all kinds of crazy cancers. So we don't use these materials anymore to make glow-in-the-dark clocks. Fortunately, now we have things like LEDs, so we can see the time whenever we want to see the time. Then in 1907, Hans Geiger and Ernest Rutherford did a little experiment. There's Hans Geiger, and there's the dashing gentleman that was Ernest Rutherford, the dashing New Zealander. They invented the Geiger counter. And what they actually discovered was that radioactivity is made of charged particles, electrically charged particles. And the idea being that if you take a tube filled with a noble gas like argon, see, argon is not capable of gaining or losing electrons because it's a noble gas. And when the radioactivity enters this little window right here and into the argon gas, don't worry, this is sealed off, the gas can't escape. It gives the argon gas an electric charge, just like if you rub your feet on the carpet and then give someone an electric shock. When enough charge builds up, it zaps to this detector wire here, which is amplified and counted. So when you hear the beep, 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 beep of a Geiger counter, what you're hearing is an electric discharge being interpreted by the internal mechanism of the Geiger counter. So right here in this wand, that would be the window. And inside of here is the argon gas. And of course, it's battery powered. And that's where this whole voltage source comes from. These were very popular during the Cold War because we were absolutely convinced that the Soviets were going to nuke us. So we had Geiger counters everywhere to detect the radioactive fallout. When I was a kid, I even found a room in an apple orchard that had a ton of cans of civil defense canned water. So yeah, they took all kinds of precautions. Now, what is the deal with radioactivity? Well, first, how do we detect it? Well, let's go back. How do we detect radioactivity? One, radioactivity can expose protected photographic film, so you could test for that. Two, radioactivity can cause glow-in-the-dark things to glow, so you can test that. Right? Very practical and somewhat dangerous. Or you can also use the ionizing properties of radiation and use a Geiger counter to detect radioactivity. So those are the ways you can detect radioactivity. Very cool. Now. What is this radioactivity made of? What are these particles? Well, natural radioactivity takes place for one simple reason. In the nucleus, you have protons, and protons have a positive charge. And positive charges repel each other, like charges repel. And you have gluons and the strong nuclear force that hold the nucleus together, prevent the protons from just simply exploding out of the nucleus like some sort of crazy spring in a box. But if there are too many neutrons or too many protons, then the nucleus cannot hold together. It will fall apart, and it falls apart in very specific ways. It can undergo alpha decay, beta decay, or positron decay. And in every single one of these cases, the nucleus will spit out, burp out, barf out a piece of itself. And in so doing, change what element you have. In natural radioactive decay, one element turns into another by spitting out a piece of itself. Now, these dots here represent the zone of stability. The zone of stability represents every isotope that has a perfect ratio of protons to neutrons that allows the nucleus to stay together forever. If you're a nucleus in the zone of stability, then you will literally last until the end of the universe. There's just going to be no way you're going to break apart. However, if you have too many neutrons, you'll undergo beta decay. If you have too many protons, you'll undergo positron decay. And if the nucleus is just simply too large, it'll undergo alpha decay. Let's look at how all of those work. 
So these unstable nuclei will burp out particles that help to bring the proton to neutron ratio back to the zone of stability. So a beta emitter, when it undergoes beta decay, will turn into an isotope that is now stable and will no longer undergo decay. Sometimes it takes more than one step to get you back to this. For example, this beta emitter right here is going to have to undergo two beta decays. It'll have to decay to here and then to here in order to form a stable nucleus. So sometimes it's going to require more than one step in order to get you back to the zone of stability. So here's the three specific kinds of decay. Alpha decay consists of two protons and two neutrons. Basically, the nucleus is just vomiting out four of its particles. <laughs> it's a great big barf. Since it's vomiting out two protons, the atomic number will drop by two. And since it's burping out four nucleons, the atomic mass will go down by four. And because there are two protons, we give it the symbol HE, which is the atomic number of helium. In fact, that's where all the helium that fills your balloons comes from. Helium does not exist naturally on Earth from any other source than alpha decay minerals, such as uranium. So when a nucleus is too large, it'll just wholesale burp out a big chunk of itself. The mass and the atomic number will both decrease by two. No, that's not right. The mass will decrease by four. So that's a lie. This is the slowest type of radioactivity in terms of how fast the decay particle travels. Alpha particles travel relatively slowly, and because they're large compared to the other kind, can be stopped very easily. If you want to stop being hit by alpha particles, just simply take a step back, because alpha particles can be stopped by just air. Air is enough to stop alpha particles. They can also be absorbed by your skin, so they can cause radioactive burns in your skin if you happen to be holding something that's giving off a lot of alpha particles all at once. Beta decay takes place when there are too many neutrons. When there are too many neutrons, the only way to get rid of a neutron is to turn it into a proton, and this takes place with beta decay. Neutron will turn into a proton and get you back to that zone of stability. The way this works is the neutron will burp out this negatively charged particle. Notice we have a charge of zero on the left and we have a combined charge of zero on the right. So the neutron burps out a negative charge, leaving behind a positive charge, which is a proton. So neutrons turn into protons when you undergo beta decay. Well, you're not going to undergo beta decay. A, a nucleus will undergo beta decay. Yeah. The atomic number will increase by one. So we're going to have one more proton. So we're going to have one more atomic number. However, the mass will not change. And it can be stopped. Well, air isn't enough to stop it. See, a beta particle is really, really tiny when you compare it to an alpha particle. So it takes a lot more to stop it. What are you going to need to stop these beta particles? Well, nothing more than aluminum foil. The electrons will be absorbed into the metal of the aluminum foil, and you won't have to worry about it. So in the event of beta decay, just take a bunch of aluminum foil and just wrap yourself up in it. And then just don't put yourself into the oven like a baked potato. So here is a beta particle. You can see the neutron turns into a proton when it burps out the beta particle. Now, notice I said vomits out with alpha and burps out with beta. Actually, beta isn't really a burp. It's more of a, a verp. You, you, are you familiar with the concept of the verp? It's a vomit burp. Like you've just eaten too much pizza and then, oh, mm, mm, chunky burp. Yes, spit it out. Maybe it was a piece of pepperoni or maybe a, an undigested or unchewed piece of sausage. It's a very, very tiny piece as opposed to a vomit where it, it, it goes from being pizza to re-pizza. Yeah. All 
All right. Anyway, um, with positron decay, this is very similar to alpha de to a beta decay, except this time you're trying to turn a proton to a neutron. So it's going to burp out the particle that makes it positive to begin with. Well, that's a major oversimplification. But what it does is it vomits out a positively charged particle. And when a proton vomits out its positive charge, it becomes neutral. So a proton will turn into a neutron by burping out a positron. You can see here the atomic mass will remain the same, but the proton will lose its positive charge in the form of the positron, leaving behind a neutrally charged neutron. Now, the atomic number is going to decrease by one because you're going to have one fewer proton than you had before. So with all these types of radioactive decay, the element you end up with is not the same element you started with. You'll notice here, the atomic number went from 55 to 56. The atomic number went up, and therefore, it's no longer cesium, it's barium. And this can also be stopped by metal foils. It does not take much to stop. Now, any of these radioactive decays can be accompanied by the emission of high-energy light. I'm not talking about, like, just ultraviolet. Ultraviolet is high-energy light, but ultraviolet has nothing on this stuff. No, when you undergo radioactivity, or rather when a nucleus undergoes radioactivity, it can also emit either X-rays or gamma rays or both. Both of these are just extremely high-energy forms of light. And being that they're made of light, they have no electric charge, and they do not change what the element is made of. Because this gamma particle is just a photon, a particle of light, and has no mass or charge, emitting a, an X-ray or a gamma ray will not change the mass and will not change the identity of the element. This travels at the speed of light, because it's actually light. And because it's so high energy, it takes a lot to stop it. You need either a solid foot of lead or at least three feet of concrete to stop a gamma ray. So this is serious stuff. Gamma rays, boy, they will mess you up. What this image is, it's actually showing a black hole emitting a gamma ray burst. Jets of part of charged particles and gamma rays being shot out at the poles of the black hole. If one of these was close enough and happened to have a beam directed right at Earth, it would basically wipe out Earth. Imagine, you know, just having like the, the universe's biggest laser beam. And that's what we're talking about here. Now, how did we know what the particle charge is? How did they know that, for example, beta particles are negative and positrons are positive and alpha particles are positive? Well, an ingenious technique. The inventor, no, okay, no, not the inventor. It's like Ben Franklin invented electricity. No, he discovered that lightning is a form of electricity. Nobody invented electricity, just like nobody invented radioactivity. But what he did was he discovered the alpha particle. And when he discovered the alpha particle, he started to play with it like a new toy to see what he could do with it. And one of the things that he chose to do with it was to shoot it at a screen that's coated with one of these glow-in-the-dark materials because they already knew that radioactivity could cause glow-in-the-dark things to glow. So they're like, all right, well, let's do that. We're going to fire these particles at this glow-in-the-dark screen, made zinc sulfide is phosphorescent, fluorescent, apply charged plates above and below, and see which way these particles get pulled. So here's how it works. We have a charged plate, positive, a charged plate, negative. We put a sample of radioactive isotope in a box with a pinhole on one side. Now, the particles are being given off in all directions, but the particles are being stopped by the box, except for the particles that travel straight towards this screen. Now, if the particle has a negative charge, it'll be attracted to the positive electrode. And if it has a negative charge, it'll be attracted 
uh, sorry, if it has a positive charge, it'll be attracted to the negative electrode. And if it has no charge, it won't be attracted to either electrode. So seeing where it glows on the screen will tell you what charge it has. And seeing how far it gets pulled towards the screen will give you an idea of how heavy the particle is. The heavier it is, the less it's going to be pulled towards either charge. The more it gets pulled, the lighter it is. So let's see. Let's start off with an alpha particle. Well, alpha particles are big, ponderous particles. So they get deflected, but not a lot. And they get deflected towards the negative electrode. So alpha particles are positively charged. Next, we try beta particles. They're very lightweight and get deflected strongly towards the positive electrode. These beta particles are negatively charged. Now let's try positrons. By their very name, I think you can figure out which way it's going to go. Positive attracts to negative, and they are pulled just as far as beta particles, which is how you can tell they have the same mass. Now, what about gamma rays? Well, gamma has no charge and therefore cannot be affected by an electric field. It goes straight through with no deflection, and this demonstrates gamma rays have no charge at all. And that is how we figure that out. Next up, how do we actually do decay reactions? But we'll save that one for next time. So as always, until next time, bye.